Okay, so Carla, you grew up in a little town yeah. called Powell River, Canada. Mm -hmm. Your father owned a retail store. That when I learned that from your master class. Oh, okay, amazing. And I was really interested in that because my grandfather owned a retail store. A menswear store? Yes. Amazing. And my mom loves, gave her this, she loves clothing in a way that I don't. How did growing up around clothing and the fabrics and touching it and feeling it and seeing how your dad made his money affect you? Um, I think it was like, it gave me an amazing work ethic because my dad was his only employee and then I was his employee and it was just kind of the shared experience. And my father and I are really close and I think it was, yeah, I just loved like a suit. I loved putting the looks together. I did the window displays. So it's like, you know, your first foray into like merchandising and styling. And I loved the service of selling somebody something, not just like selling them like a hustle, but like helping them and taking care of them. Like it was very much like, how can we help you today? That kind of store, old haberdashery. How has your uh, love of clothing evolved? What do you really love about fashion now? Ooh. I think for me, like designers are my rock stars. I mean, I love rock stars too, don't get me wrong. I love a musician, but for me, it's like, oh wow, to be able to take someone's um, creations and then, you know, interpret them on my clients. That's kind of the best, yeah. So it's cool. art. I love the creative process. That's one of the things I garnered from your master class was the process of yes, it all. Yes, it's all a process. It's already done by the time we get there. So you wrote on Instagram, I was never a great student or mm -hmm. really great at anything when I was younger. Mm -hmm. I found that hard to believe. I was not. <laughs> I was a great slacker. <laughs> you said, even though I hated school, I loved learning and being inspired by the world around me. And I was, and still am, a really hard worker. Mm -hmm. When did you realize that your path maybe wasn't going to be a traditional one? You know, and kudos to anybody who has like an amazing high school, junior high, elementary school experience with great teachers. I didn't have that. Like I can honestly say I don't feel like, I mean this is so mean, but I don't feel like I had a great teacher. I had one great substitute teacher who I was like, oh wow. This is what it could be like. So if you have amazing teachers, you're so lucky. Take it all in. Yeah, I don't know. I, I don't know that I ever subscribed to some idea of traditional. I mean, I did like briefly go to like college and then I was like, eh, I'm not sure this is for me. I kind of just like was never stressed out and always just like flowed with it. I kind of knew I would always end up being great at something. I don't know. I don't know if I thought I would be great at something, but I was never worried. So I have a lot of chill, I guess. <laughs> Can you expand on that? Because for somebody who felt like they weren't great at anything growing mm -hmm. up, to always know deep down that you're going to be great at something is very interesting. Yeah, I guess I'm really pragmatic. I don't like suffer like fools, you know what I mean? Like I was like, no, I was not a good student. Like I did not excel in that system and I wasn't a great athlete. But then when I got a little older, I was like, oh, I started running and I'm like, oh, I'm really good at this and I enjoy it. So. You know, I also think, God, if your glory years are high school, I have such disappointing news for you. Like, I just knew I'd be okay, because I guess ultimately I still believed in myself. Mm -hmm. I just knew I had to kind of figure it out. We're going to touch on your 5,000 companies that you run. Oh, yes. <laughs> All of them at some point during yes. this interview. Yeah. Think about what makes you such a great leader. If you could boil it down to one or two things, humility aside. Right. Because I interview a lot of busy people. Mm -hmm. I was really taken by how you're able to be excellent in so many different arenas. I don't think that's very common. Wow. Well, I don't know that I'd call myself a great leader. I feel like I'm super passionate about what I believe in, and I understand that somehow I've gotten to a point of like, some sort of platform and I think it's because I'm totally fearless like I don't care if you don't want to work with me because I just said this you know it's not like I haven't done gaps of course we all have and there's huge amounts of learning that take place as you educate yourself and you learn everything that goes into it but I do understand that even though I didn't wasn't great at anything I still have this like amazing kind of platform and way I can help other people so there's that so I am fearless I like that word. Um, 
Yeah, I don't know. And maybe it's because I wasn't good at anything that I'm so driven to be. But I also, I think I get great pleasure out of the people I work with being super happy or companies being successful and having impact. It's a bit of a mixed bag. I haven't quite figured it out. I hear you. Yeah. You ran a restaurant, mm. you waitressed, went to food and beverage school, mm -hmm. you were a maitre d', mm -hmm. a sommelier. Yeah. I always mispronounce that word. Yeah, you did great. Thank you very much. What set you up for success in this industry, do you think? All of it. Like, that's what I think. I think there's no, there's nothing that I haven't done that haven't led me to this moment from dusting my dad's shelves to having a paper route and having to go and talk to people and collect the money for the papers every month. I mean, I was 11 years old that I had a paper route. Yeah. You know, the restaurant industry is not much different than working with celebrities. You're like serving people. Um, yeah. That's interesting. Yeah, so everything has really, I don't think anything goes to waste. Like if people say, oh, I wasted my time doing that. No, you didn't. It's just, it'll help you in your next step. And it's, you know, at the restaurant too, I was, had an amazing mentor and he really gave me such guiding principles in life but I also was managing you know a team of 16 people and and that's hard you very know you hard. develop very it's hard what some people don't realize it's like it's hard to be the boss because you're the one who gets shit on because you have to have thick skin everyone at work that works at a restaurant is usually hooking up and so it's hard to lead that group oh, as well well you know what i mean <laughs> the amazing thing was it was all women and my oh, some of good. my best friends have come from that restaurant and i'm sure that was his design from who hired everybody but that's funny like my best girls are from that time in life and that's where i met my husband who you said that he kind of gave you the idea that working in fashion was something that might be possible not really so i secretly always wanted to be in fashion. I briefly went to the restaurant business because I had seen Michelle Pfeiffer in Tequila Sunrise and I was like, oh my God, that's exactly what I want to do. I want to be like this. And then, but I always think I knew. So yeah, I could either have been like a restaurant owner or then I was like, God, that's when you kind of saw styling and you realize, oh, wait a minute, behind all these images, there's a person making these decisions. And I was like, oh, well, I want to be that person. So I started working towards it and knowing, and then just like magic, here comes this gentleman and whisks me away to Los Angeles, and here I am. And the rest is history. The rest is history. Thanks, Tracy Matthew. Ellis Ross, mm -hmm. Justin and Haley Bieber, mm -hmm. Olivia Wilde, who you killed at the Oscars. It was gorgeous. Mm -hmm. Sarah Paulson. Who was your first celebrity client? Olivia Wilde. Really? Yeah. Well, or if you want to go even a little further back, the musician Feist, cool. 18 years ago, 17 years ago, and then Olivia was 16 years ago. How did you guys meet originally? We did a photo shoot together, and she was like, well, you be my stylist? And here we still are. Was that when she was on the OC? No, she just moved over to house. Oh, wow. So it was still really early in her career. Yeah, both of us. So she gets the real Grew place together. of honor, which she likes to have. That of course she's the she's the first yeah yeah I think she earned it yeah 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 <laughs> what are some of the biggest lessons that you learned from your early jobs oh my god I mean it's so funny I just made a pact with myself when I started that I wouldn't say no to anything mm -hmm. I don't know if that was the, really the best idea but because it's taken me a long time to learn how to say no I just thought yeah. I could always learn something and so that was it. And even when it was shitty and like the jobs were like, uh, there was one job in particular that was like, I had a room like this big full of clothes and the girl came in and she's like, so you have nothing. And I was like, oh, this is so wrong. But yeah, no, just that I could learn and that I wanted to always take something away. And I always wanted to bring my best like self to the client, to the photographer, just to, like show up and do it and not really complain. So similar to the restaurant industry, mm -hmm. what you just mentioned is like when somebody is unhappy. Yeah. One of the things that you have to do is still be happy. You still have to pull through because it's not about us. You know, that's hard. Really hard. Yeah. You don't really get to have a bad day when you're working with celebrities. I guess that means you have to ha be able to have a bad day with the people in your personal life. They they have to be yeah, poor them. Real people. Yeah. That's a hard thing that's 
and I'm sure there's tons of conversations about stylists right now because our friend law, you know, but that's a hard thing. You have to save your best self for your family or your, your community outside of work and your worst side for them, which is, that's kind of hard, right? But that's also partnerships and marriage and family and that's why you have them. So like when you see La Roche feel like they're just done, mm -hmm. is that a feeling that you understand? Yeah, of course. There's no stylist who, at our level who doesn't know that feeling. And amazing, good for you. Go do like bigger, amazing things. Like we don't have yeah. to be stuck in, like in my whole career showed that. I don't have to stay being a maitre d' or sommelier. I can come become like a pretty major stylist and then I can go run a company and like then go do like mission work around the world. Like there's so many lanes and we don't have to think that we can evolve. And I think that's a real, a newer thing because the creative is. world is very, it's still siloed. You do this and you do this and you do this and you do this. And I, I actually think I'm one of the first stylists who really was like, nah, you know, I was one of the first stylists to have a big collaboration and to have my own brand. And I did it a decade ago. You know, you see everybody doing it now and mm -hmm. that's amazing. And I hope people jump on their opportunities. But like, I was always gonna be the, make the decision, like, I'm not just gonna do this. And I know, I understand that thing of like, we have high value. Mm -hmm. So like, yeah. You know, but you also get tired, of course. It's a very tiring time of year. I want to talk about your Levi's collab. Mm -hmm. um, so like you mentioned, stylists weren't doing collaborations. No. How did you get the idea that you could? Well, I don't know. I'm just kind of always had great ideas for other people. And I'd be like, oh, God, you know what you should do? Here's your, like, amazing idea. And then one day, it actually started with doing the T-shirts with Justin first. I was like, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to make a great T-shirt. And then we did that, and then actually Levi's called and said, hey, would you want to do something? And I was like, yes, I would. Because that's kind of my uniform, and I loved the thread of like American iconic things, the white t-shirt, the 501, mm -hmm. denim, democratization. Like I thought it told maybe my love affair with America, being a Canadian, like I was wow. like, oh, I love this place, and I love these iconic things. And so I'm always trying to like weave a little story. You just kind of have to look for it. I didn't think about it like that. No, I mean, this is my internal story to myself. But that's really it. The song. Yoko Ono song yeah. uh, is the backtrack yeah. of that awesome yeah. Levi's video. And you have yes. all these really powerful women in yes. it. Who all showed up for free. Because when we, I really took the reins, sorry Levi's, but at the time they were like, put on the brakes and I was like no 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 I kept on asking I was like listen we're gonna give all the money of this they had already agreed that we would give all the money to gun safety which obviously hugely necessary but no brand was really doing it and they wanted to kind of be quiet about it no one wanted to touch no one wanted to I touch just feel it. like we should yeah, drive that home exactly this is not yesterday this was years ago and so I kept on like DMing girls and asking them to be in it and all my girls and everybody was like sure but I was like listen the whole value of whatever we sell is going to every town. So we kept on doing it, we doing it, and then my friend Matthew shot the video and it was amazing. And our friend who's our editor, Noah Herzog, he pulled the Yoko Ono song up. It was like, you know, it's the revolution, you know, mm. incredible. And it was like so perfect. And they were like, there's no way you're gonna get this song. And Levi's went to Yoko Ono's lawyer and team and they passed. And then I was like, I just don't believe it. And I wrote her, because before I even started the campaign, there was like this line in one of her really kind of iconic books. It's called Grapefruit. And it's like, this line is a part of a circle. And I just thought, well, isn't that everything about life? And the thread of your clothing is a line and how we're all connected. And so I wrote her a letter and I put that on it and I drew it for her. And I wrote her this letter and then I took a picture of it and I asked only one other person, two other people have seen the letter. I sent it to Ali Paul, who at the time was repping everything Levi's, and I said, can you just get this to Yoko Ono? And, okay, fine, sent it. And then I folded it and I put it in my desk. And then I had to go do a job in New York and the phone rang. And, you know, right after Parkland, it just happened. So even before, when we were giving the money to every town, Parkland hadn't happened yet. And then all of a sudden Parkland happened. And I got a call 
uh, from the gal from Levi's, and she's like, two things. She said, Yoko Ono said yes. And did you he, scream? Yeah, I actually cried, and I'm not that emotional. And then she said, and Levi's is going to commit a million dollars to awesome. gun safety. And I was like, wow, this is such an amazing day. And I can see myself right now. I can see I was at the Bowery, and I was like, this is like the most amazing day. And I was like, you know, thank you. And then I, and then Yoko tweeted at me, and I was like, she tweeted the campaign out. Really? And yeah. I was like, what an amazing amazing woman and yeah it was a special campaign I watched it a few times yeah if anybody needs to feel fired up totally they should just watch that on totally YouTube. all these like baller checks yeah and I love that you did it in black and white because yeah. it was like you would expect denim like of course yeah. it would be in color yeah no nope. nope. and they were like so cool. don't we want men and I was like no we do not want men it is not time for men right now <laughs> <laughs> it's know, been time for them. <laughs> They've had lots and lots and lots and lots of time. How about we just do this? But yeah, it was pretty amazing. It yep. really was. I just found that letter and I was like, I'm just going to frame it, fold it. I'm not really sentimental. I'm always looking forward, which is like my great flaw, one of, one of many flaws. But that's like, or oh, great gifts. Like, yeah, maybe. There's always I two like sides. That. Yeah, there is two sides to everything, isn't there? Yeah. Yeah. So you've called Justin Bieber the most formidable relationship in your career. Mm. I was kind of surprised by that because of all of the powerhouses that you work with. Yeah. Well, you can't name a woman and not every, the rest of them, so it's easy to say Justin. <laughs> 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 nobody can get like nobody can get kind of bent. That's a good point. <laughs> but that is, uh, but it's also the truth. He is. But how did working with Justin change your career? Well, I just learned so much because it was like chaos because it would be like all of a sudden, oh, I need a long shirt and I'd have to figure out how to make it. Or we did, he let me tour design, like costume design all his tours. And like, I had never done that. And they'd be like, I need a white outfit and it needs to be in Belgium in two days. And I would design it and then have it made. And then just like the, the pivot and the movement and just the complete freedom he has in how he approaches the world as being is like such a fun collaborator. I mean, I still get stressed out because I want to make sure it's great for him. Yeah. But he's just wild. There were two cool things about your relationship with him, in my opinion. Okay. One was that you originally were trying to work with Usher. Yes, hilarious. My childhood crush. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so nice. I get why you also yeah, yeah, loved yeah, yeah, Usher. Yeah. And you ended up getting to work with him, and he said, hey, I have this kid. I yeah. Want. So I loved how that happened so Isn't organically. Isn't that crazy? And then Obviously but I didn't work with that, that kid. I was like, well, I'm not interested in this kid. That's right when he found Justin, when I did that, a couple jobs with Usher. And he's, I, he's like, oh, I've just discovered this kid, this Canadian kid. And I was like, ah. Even with the Canada tie, you were like, eh. Mm -mm. I mean, that was 18 years ago. And then he became the biggest star yeah, on the planet. Yeah, and then so I came in on like his second album. Wow. Yeah. That's really cool. Yeah. Um, I know. It's, life is so funny. But you got to believe in a little bit of magic, and I actually think there's lots around me. We're going to get into that. Oh, okay. The second part that I thought was cool was that you talked about, like, this idea of cultivating an image. Mm. And I don't know why, but I'd never thought about that. I thought about clothes and right. styling. Yeah. No. It's no. No. It's so much more than that. Yeah. You're crafting an entire story is right. really what like it is. Like you're giving them what the public sees and what they get to how you want to project yourself into the world and how you want to be seen. Because it's, it's very hard for them, right? Like, oh my God, if you've ever seen a red carpet, you know, right? Blah, 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 blah. It's like crazy, crazy, crazy. And so it's like a little bit of armor to face the world. and. Oh, interesting. And, you know, and it's a huge business. Okay, if we do X, Y, Z, we're going to end up with a Balenciaga campaign or we're going to end up with a Miu Miu Prada, Revlon, you name it. That's the goal. There's, I'm very acutely aware of the business of all of it. There's strategy behind it. A hundred percent. I didn't even think about There's that. There's strategy behind everything. I mean, of course, the strategy yeah. could also be like, I look hot, let's have fun. <laughs> Which, I love that strategy. But still a strategy. It's still a strategy. So... How does it go from story to gown? Because 
you talk about how you see something in your mind, you pull a ton of different options, mm -hmm. and I love that you make your clients try on absolutely everything. That's your rule. Well, when I first start with them, I do. So I'll tell you this last Oscar, every single girl was the first dress we tried on, and we didn't try on any other dress. Because they knew when they... Because I knew. Oh, damn. Yeah. I know what you're going to wear when you come into it. Like, if it's the first time we're seeing and we're getting to know each other, I like people to try everything on so then we can like find what works. But then my great skill is actually that it's well edited and ready and I already have an idea of what people want because I want to save people their time mm -hmm. too. I mean, of course, it's fun to play. But, but not always. Not always. Like, we're all busy. Let's get it done. Like, Olivia came in. She's like, well, what are you thinking? And I was like, I'd seen the Gabriella Hearst dress when it showed and I asked for it. And then I like, am persistent to make sure that I get it. And then I got it and I was like, here's the dress. She's like, I don't need to try on anything else. You talk about how those relationships um, have been built over 20 years. Correct. There is this idea that goes around, mostly Instagram, but I've seen it online that's like, I don't charge you for my time, I charge you for my experience. Mm. You know, it took 20 yeah. years to be able to do something in 10 Correct. seconds. Yeah. And you very much drive that point home. Yeah. Correct. Like you're able to call someone in Italy and say, I need a suit for Justin. Yes, yes. I, I wrote that for that little Celine when it was like, hey, I'm, we're going to go see President Macron. And he didn't have a suit. And I made it happen in less than an hour. And that was in the room, fit it. And so, yeah, and that's, that's your years of experience. So, yeah. And I can be a little bold about it because guess what? I've worked for 20 fucking years. Like, yeah. sorry, you don't get to do it necessarily. Or, or great, there's always going to be new. I was new once. But you, there's something about, like, I've earned it. This is an earning it business. Say more about that. I can command the respect because I've given the respect mm -hmm. and I can command the rate I ha can get because I've earned it. And I, you know, I have a couple clients I consult with and they're not famous and, but they want to live in a space and I'm like, you're buying what I know. It's not just a day rate. It's, it's a career rate. That's a nice way of putting it. Yeah. Let's talk about the magic. Okay. How do you know magic when you see it in the scope of fashion? Because it just makes you feel something like you see like and I love to like cheer everybody on like if I see a stylist who's just done something that makes me like ah I'll text them right away or I'll DM them or I'll write yay on their Instagram because I think that is amazing and it, it feels good and it means I see you but I think like you yeah. just feel it and you know you've got it and it's like I get quite emotional like someone puts a dress on and I like it I get a little teary eyed that's when I know I it's right really yeah I have to love what I do because, you know, like, like we said, it is a, it's a tough, rough business. Like yeah. it's full of glory and it looks super glamorous, but like, did we go to sleep on Sunday night? No. Did we have to be back in the office the next day to get all the returns and get everything out? And I don't even do that much of that anymore. My team does like it is a grind. Mm -hmm. So you better love it. When your eyes well up. Mm hmm. What are they welling up for? Just that it's the perfect something for someone. That it works. That it works. One thing I notice is that you're really not a complainer. No, I hate complainers. I <laughs> noticed that about your videos. If I gave you 60 seconds, you don't even have to take that long, mm -hmm. to throw it all out on the table, what is the most frustrating part about what you do? Is it the, because the you're not doing the returns anymore. I know that part is so annoying. What's the most annoying part of what I do? I mean, I think it's like when you get second guessed. Oh. Or if someone like Monday quarterbacks. Bitch, you just looked fucking amazing and you felt amazing. Don't tell me two days later that something was wrong. Like, keep it, keep it to yourself. I am not here to be unloaded on. Mm -hmm. They are. And they, but they all unload on you. But like that, I think would be the only complaint. And, and I think maybe it's a complaint that I'm like, it's hard to find balance mm -hmm. for the more important things in life. Because we're so like reactive and driven in this space. But I don't love complaining. I don't love 
putting, I won't ever put up that it's three o'clock in the morning, I'm still working or that I've worked 20 days in a row. I don't like that grind. I like trying to slow my time and just being calm and thankful that I get to do it and that I'm there and that, oh wow, I actually have a career that is amazing. And that you built so much to be busy. Yeah, yeah. yeah. How do you think you've made your mark on the styling world? Because I think it's more, if I may yes, I love jump it. in, no, I, I love my that. reflection is that it's, you were the first to do a lot of things actually, yeah. which was sort of interesting because there's yeah. been a lot of stylists before you. Correct. What do you want your legacy to be here? Oh my God, I don't even know that there could be. I just, that I was kind and tried my best and that, but I do think, I think that I worked with girls in TV and I worked with girls who weren't sample size and that I pushed, you know, a lot of the younger stylists won't even know that this happened, but like I pushed so many designers to make a dress for XYZ who wasn't a sample size and shifted that narrative and maybe older women too, like mm -hmm. actually there's huge value here. Why wouldn't you dress this person and leverage right. that and that and that I really did break the lane we were in by doing other stuff. So I hope that would kind of be that. I don't know, it's, but I hope my legacy is, you know, more on the phase that I'm going into now. Would you consider that more of the activism? Yeah, like the period company, yeah. You created period underwear. Mm -hmm. You could have done a lot of things. Correct. What experience led you into this? Well, I think it was my kid getting their period early, which, was such a terrible experience and I thought god did how could I be failing at this like I'm I'm a mom, I'm like got it together I am a feminist I am or, you know somewhat organized I'm not afraid of these things and all of a sudden I was like wow I'm really not succeeding here and then I you think about your own first period and you're like oh well, that was a nightmare and then you realize I think everybody's got a horrible period story because wow cultures made periods horrible for so long and so it was a real like the t-shirts like the collaborations it was a real light bulb moment for me where I was like I because period underwear did exist and but it was very very expensive and it didn't really wasn't like that good I was gonna say it was kind of ugly too well and it was just like it didn't absorb it was like a backup plan you yeah. know because we all know fucking tampons leak so you were like okay I caught it with my period underwear but I thought this is something that every kid needs and every mom needs. And actually, wait a minute, I'm making so much waste with my own period. This is something that I need because I don't want to have all this garbage mm -hmm. that never goes anywhere because it never decomposes. The first period product you ever used is still on the planet right now. What? Yes. Pads and tampons don't decompose and neither does the plastic. They all come in. Oh my God. Yeah, so it's gross. I never thought, I only thought about how there, a lot of them are really toxic for our bodies, but I well, didn't even think too. about the other part. Yeah, so we actually came at it from an angle of like necessity and making sure that everybody could afford it. Like we wanted to come in it as a mass thing because you know, it was like wow. you could buy a period underwear for $40. Who could afford that? So I wanted to make something super accessible and affordable and sustainable and just like better for the earth and then better for your body because of the toxins, of course. Mm -hmm. And then it's just snowballed into this incredible brand and this amazing mission to be like, you know what? Nobody on the planet should not have period products. And 80% of people who period here on earth don't have access, which- 80%? Yeah, so period poverty is such a, wow. It's mind blowing and it's the first thing we learned real fast. So we've set up this mission vertical, which is, a huge part of our business where we'll work with any organization or government or nonprofit mm -hmm. and we sell them our underwear at cost so we're not making money but to make sure that they're getting it out globally to people who need it so we're in Ghana, Kenya, Dominican Republic, Costa Rica, Haiti, Hawaii, we're all over the United States doing the mission work as as well as the direct to consumer and now of course we're in Walmart. Yay! Not to get too in the weeds. But no, I love in the weeds. How did you figure out how to contact the U.S. government to do this? Like, how do you well, like... Well, the government is a whole... It's, so it's like global governments. It's like governments in... But how do you access that? Well, you like, work with like nonprofits. You find angels who are out there in the world to help you, wow. which I've got one and she's amazing. And she like, we did this project through Columbia University uh, in Ghana. And it's just like... 
You're tapping into these networks. I'm tapping into, like, I have this incredible, like I said, like, everything has gotten me here. You know, we launched this brand that all of a sudden we had, you know, 70,000 followers because all the celebrities I worked with were like, yay, Carla, of course we'll post for you. You know, it's like a leg up that many brands don't have. Mm -hmm. But I'm like, I didn't get it for free. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Like, I, I've done the work so that my people will help me in this world. And that so it's just, part. it's just working and connecting and being like relentless. Like I can't, couldn't believe in something more in a bigger way than what, how I believe in this company and, and believe into, and, and by the way, yeah, I love being in Walmart and I love the direct to consumer business being like an eight figure business. Amazing, like two years in. But for me, it's the focus on like, I bet you we in 10 years can eradicate period poverty in, in a sustainable way. And that's where I'm going. So you said that if people and do, pretty dresses <laughs> and what and, and pretty, pretty dresses yeah that yeah. too yeah that too but then you get to wear pretty dresses when you have your period because there's no yeah, problem exactly you said if people viewed their period as a superpower it would be a different world yeah I know that's a pretty simple statement but it blew my mind because as I was growing up I was so embarrassed correct mine. isn't that ridiculous I had so much shame until like all a, of us two did. years ago all of us did and could you imagine if you taught people who don't get a period that it's a superpower. There wouldn't be the crazy God. fucked up shit there is. And, and, and period shame is a culture of the patriarchy and of advertising and of like holding a whole population of people down. And really, there's nothing embarrassing about it. And I have like such a horrible story. I was on the basketball team in high school and we had to wear white shorts, brutal. And I got my period. And I mean, the sweet boy, Jason Evans came, was like, Carly, you got your period. And the coach of the team laughed at me. And that was a grown ass man laughing at me. I wish I could remember his name because I would like mm -hmm. dox him right now. But a grown man laughing at a 15 year old girl with their period, like shame on you. Yeah. Shame on you. You'll never forget that. I'll never forget it. Yeah. And, and it's so interesting because, you know, we do like, we have amazing customer service and we, I do a lot of the customer service as well. Sasha, my partner, Sasha, and I do it. Um, Why? Because we want to hear what people have to say. Yeah. And we're following, like, we're just like, that's the greatest. The only way we can really create change is by making a really amazing community. And we, we actually think our company is like an idea with a meaningful community. Mm -hmm. That's what it is. Like a meaningful community based around a great idea. And so that's how we can activate people to be like, tell their stories and create change and think about it differently in their own lives. Cause we're asking them to do something different mm -hmm. by being like, yeah, actually my period's great. They're almost like the, your period ambassadors. Correct. Everybody wears a pair. Yeah. So in addition to the period company, you created an app called Wishy. Yes. That makes booking a personal stylist affordable. Yeah. You obviously created X Carla. Yeah. Which started as a, a, the collab between you yeah. and Justin. Yeah. It seems like you had a dream, the rocket ship took off, mm -hmm. and I know it's not without hardship because it of never course. is. No, of course not, yeah. What's been the most trying time in your career? Ooh, what's been the most trying time? I think it's like realizing that when you're starting, you're like, you want it all. Mm -hmm. And when you, and, and the celebrity part of it is probably it. Like, cause you're like, everybody wants the big girl. Like there's healthy competition where you're like, oh, why did I get that girl? So that it's not, I don't want to say it's jealousy cause it's not, but it is where you're like, damn, mm -hmm. I want that movie star. But also, I mean, I'm actually going to change my answer, but you can keep that answer. Cause that's a significant thing that I think younger stylists need to know. It's like, it'll come mm -hmm. and be thrilled with who you have and what you're building. But I think it's like trying to find that balance cause it's hard. Balance meaning what? Like the like, work life, like the celebrity work, like, style world is life. so consuming where you're like, uh, I'm exhausted. Yeah. But you got to like check out. Is there anything that you would do differently looking back? No. Nah. Because you learned something from that. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Okay, this is a happy one. Is there a moment or a night? And I'm going to preface this because when I first moved to LA and I was doing red carpets for free, mm -hmm. I was so... Like I had this idea of where I wanted to be and where I wanted to go. So I was so intense. Yeah. And it was never this, I was never in that moment. I was like 15 years ahead. Right. 
is there a moment in your career that you wish you could relive because you didn't really take it all in? An event, a moment. Oh my God. I mean, I don't think I take in any moment. Still? I know, I do, I do, I do. <laughs> I think that I wish I could. Ah. Honestly, I really don't have regrets. Like I think, should I had a little more fun and said yes to more of the fun things? Instead of just being like, I'm working, da 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 da. Yeah. I mean, maybe go to one more party, but but not really. I'm I'm totally content. Yeah. Yeah. Like that. I think that's a boring answer, but it's the truth. The truth is never boring. I okay. like that. Okay, good. Yeah. I think there's also you're speaking to something that a lot of women right out of college feel because they're like, how much of my life should I be living versus right. what am I building? Right. It's a hard. Well, balance. that's that is a hard one because you'll never get to where I am without making the sacrifices. There's and so many. I had an assistant once and I was like, girl, you ain't in the same place as me. Like, I was like, oh, I need this stuff out of my car. Oh, you don't want to bring it in? And I was like, the 10 minutes that would take me is 10 minutes I can spend somewhere else on other stuff. And if you don't think that I haven't carried all those bags with nobody, then you don't know what it takes to get to where I am. So I do believe that there's sacrifice, of course. I could just balance like in the parenthood. I'm more talking of like, oh, I could have made a few smarter decisions just in terms of being like a more present mother. Got it. But no, hell no, you have to, you have to put in the work. It, you do not get here otherwise. Did you? Or you don't stay here. That's, that's interesting. So you see people get there and not be able to. Yeah, of course. Dude, there's so many flashes in the pan. Hmm. Listen, I've, I've, I've had the same clients for 17 years. Yeah, there's a reason. Yeah. I also see with stylists, tell me if I'm wrong, that like it's like like attracts like. Yeah. You know, like you have all these like powerhouse feminist outspoken women. It's yeah, like, sure, that's sure, who sure. you are. Yeah, of course. Yeah. I mean, cool. I'd love a gent, somebody gentle. No. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, I want all women to be feminists. Come on, and men to be feminists too. Yeah. 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 You give a lot of great fashion advice, oh. and it's very practical. Which I love. I love. Yeah. What's a go-to piece of wisdom that you think applies both to life and to fashion? Just wear the dress. Don't hold anything. Like, that's what it's there for, you know? There's um, like a term in the sneaker world, one to rock, one to stock. One to rock, one to stock, amazing. They'll like stock it and yeah, save yeah, it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's like, just wear the shoes. Just wear the shoes. They're not going to be cool in five years. Or they might be in 10. But in who 20. has so much space? Yeah. I just don't think of holding on, oh, I'm going to, for something special. God, today is special. You're breathing and living, and it's like, today is, that's all you have, yeah. is today. So make today amazing. Wear the dress is a really good one. Okay, can I grab those from you? We're going to play a quick game. Oh, okay. <laughs> oh, my God. I love it. This is my homemade arts and crafts. I love it. I love arts and crafts. Me too. I actually had fun doing these. It's called Behind the Scenes. Uh -huh. <laughs> I love Behind the Scenes. That's what my little newsletter is called. Oh, really? Yeah. I thought it was clever. Oh, well, my that God. It is. We're both clever. <laughs> That's even better that it's something that you do. OK. So I want to know the story behind the look, what cool. you remember. From, yeah. These are all kind of iconic moments. Yes, they are. I love it. So okay. Tracy Ellis Ross, 2018 Emmys. Yeah. Incredible. Uh, that is a Valentino haute couture and Tracy and I were actually in Paris and we saw it come down the runway and we were like, oh my God. And that was the first time that collection from Pier Paolo was like the really the first time in probably since the 80s that huge volume was shown. Like now we see volume, but we didn't see volume. And we were like, I actually got to place two looks from that collection. And I was like, we have to have this look. And when it came, I was like, oh my God, are we crazy? And then we concocted this whole girl, surfer, story, skin, orange. And uh, people were blown away by this dress. You know you won when like you post that first picture and your phone lights up and every stylist is just like, yes. That's why, that's why I love it. I love hearing from my peers. And uh, the funny, the best part of the story, and I say it in my master class, was like she got out of her car and her publicist was like mortified. And then we were like, yes, 
<laughs> I like that you're not scared of the worst dress list. Like you're like, no. I want to go for it. Also, I think it's outrageous that there are still worst dress lists. Bugger off. I agree. Yep. Okay, this is Sarah Paulson at the New York Ocean's 8 premiere in 2018. Yep. This is one of my favorite dresses of all time. And I, in the runway where this idea was shown, it was shown short. And I have a really wonderful relationship with Prada. And so I started stalking them. And I'm like any showroom and any designer team will tell you that I am the most persistent person. Like I fight so hard for my girls. That's probably where all the energy would get sucked too. But I was like, I need it. I need that dress. Da, 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 da. And then I think my final email to Verde was like, just give me the fucking dress. <laughs> and then like a you huge box showed up and they had made it for me as a gown. And I was like, oh, amazing. And then we tried it on and it was a little like, it needed some work. And I was like, it needs a belt. It didn't have a belt. And so wow. then we refitted and the Prada team worked on it and then they made that bag and they made that belt and it was like amazing. And the crazy thing was I wasn't with Sarah in New York to get her dressed and I was on set and she was texting me and she's like, I don't think the hair's right. I don't think the makeup's right. And I was like, get on a FaceTime with me. And it was my good friend, Chris McMillan. And he was like, I'm thinking about this. And I was like, Chris, I fought so fucking hard for that dress. If you fuck that makeup up, I'm going to show up in New York and kill, not makeup, hair up. I'm gonna show up and kill you. This is how we're doing the hair. He's like, okay, honey, I got it, I got it, I got it. And then she went on the carpet. And the best, best part, besides all of the best parts that made this dress, is that Rihanna walked up to Sarah and she didn't go on the, first didn't even stop on the carpet. She's like, bitch, what are you wearing? No. And in their interview for Interview Magazine, Rihanna was like, I was so jealous of that look. I was so mad. And I was like, wow. That's amazing. Yeah. Ugh. I loved it. Haley and Justin 2022 Grammys. Yep. <laughs> this felt very Jennifer Aniston to me. Uh, so which I love. And perfect. Yeah. And she was wearing like uh, Diamonds by the Yard by Tiffany. And it was just like so pretty. When we tried it on, she had actually two little braids in her hair. And we just loved how like simple it was. And actually, Justin had a completely different look. That's custom Balenciaga, but he had a completely different look on. And uh, talk about you always have to be prepared. Also with Justin, you have to have a lot of clothes. And he's like, Haley was like, Carla, he's not dressy enough for me. And I was like, I've got something. And I pulled out that suit and we put it on with the crazy Crocs. And he always loves to wear a beanie. But Justin's fearless. Like the amount of shit we got over this, it's like you either got it or you didn't. I loved it. It's like instantly an iconic picture. Well, you would, you said this in your masterclass, but like people will, say they'll chirp yeah and then all of a sudden six weeks later Correct. you see all the coffee caps yeah it's kind of a great compliment yeah um oh i think that was the last one. Oh, cute we went through all of them yeah okay just some quick rapid okay, fires okay. you're done with me okay you were a sommelier yes did i do that right yeah god what's the best wine to give someone when you go to their house oh my god i'm so out of the loop but i would say like uh Burgund uh, burgundy which is like uh, a red burgundy is Pinot Noir and from the Mercury Appalachian in France. Very, very unknown, very great. That's but very keep it cheap. around like between 30 and 50. Nobody needs to have like anything more than that for dinner at their house. Like, come on. I like that. Yeah. Okay, a client you'd love to work with that you haven't yet. First female president in the United States. Oh, I like that. Yeah. Who is if she's someone? a Democrat. <laughs> <laughs> no fucking Republicans, thanks. Yeah. Who is someone in Hollywood that inspires you? My husband, Matthew Elt. Who's someone outside of Hollywood that inspires you? Whew. I just met Malala, and that was pretty, she's pretty amazing. Great answer at the Oscars. Very cool. Mm -hmm. An underrated style icon. Oh my God. An underrated style icon, Justin Bieber. A piece of clothing you've gotten the most wear out of? Any of my 501s. A movie you watch when you're sad. Call me by your name. Really? Yeah, because Clem loves to watch it when he's sad too, and so we just sit and cry. <laughs> <laughs> have you watched Shrinking? No. You have. If you okay. like that movie, you have to watch Shrinking. Okay, okay. Something simple you do to turn a bad day around. I go for a walk with my dogs. A book that changed your life, something you think everyone should read. Emergent Strategy by Adrienne Marie Brown. 
That came very quickly. Yeah, it's a, a crack your brain open. It's a it's a book for imagining a better world. I've never even heard of it. Yeah, it's incredible. Get it. The smartest decision you've ever made. Marrying Matthew Welch. And do a pretty smart question. Oh, okay. So feel free to pick anyone that, yep. Am I asking you? Uh, no, you. Oh my God. What's something you wish people could see about you that they don't see at first glance? That I'm actually very sensitive. Really? Yeah. I would never know that. Yeah, I'm a little bit sensitive. It's the Virgo. We have a, like a hard shell, but we're soft hearted. Soft on the inside. Soft on the inside. That's great. Yeah. My last question for you is uh -huh. uh, a great lesson that you've learned from your kid. Oh my God. To see people fully. And you can't see your expectations. Because the universe will be like, hold my beer. <laughs> <laughs> or hold my burgundy, in this case. Or hold my birkin. <laughs> yeah, hold my birkin. Not quite there yet. Uh. I love it. Thank you, Carla. Thank you so much. What an absolute pleasure.